It was a really difficult decision-making process, wasn't it? And the standard of um, the applications was fantastic. Yeah, it was very high, and um, I think we either there were, I think it would be fair to say, more than two wonderful candidates, and it was it was tough on the people who, had, who didn't win. And uh, in the end, I think we w we all went for uh, Daisy and Phoebe because we felt um, not only did they have a really imaginative idea and something really special to, to to present, but they had a real confidence about how they'd execute it as well, and uh, it was very exciting. Very exciting. Here you are, and um, you know, massive award-winning. Um, director, you're associate director of the RSC, you're the uh, artistic director um, of Headlong. You've had numerous like triumphs, including Enron and the Patrick Stewart Macbeth, you're a film director. You studied at Cambridge, you know, very rarefied atmosphere. What did you actually study there? What? Uh, English, English literature. Yeah. And w was that sort of like crucial in terms of where you wanted to be and what you wanted to do? When, when, when did you get the bug or, or wake up and realise, I want to be a theatre director, this is... I was a terrible actor. Um, uh, we had a kind of, um, a kind of interesting uh, bunch of people who were very interested in the theatre at my school at the time. It's a little kind of strange pocket that sometimes comes together in a couple of classes, two or three years. I think probably everyone, here, certainly in drama, who enters drama at some level wants to be a performer, even if they end up being the lighting designer. At some level they dream of being... Um, yeah, Olivier, and uh, you then ration rationalise your inability to reach that point. Uh, uh, unfortunately, mine happened early enough where uh, I kind of realised that it was something I wanted to be involved in, but not, not on stage. And, uh, and then when I went to university, actually I did more acting than directing because uh, it was just very hard to get into, you know, like the professional world. I, I acted in one play in my second year, and I'd always had terrible nerves before going on before, before a play. And on the first preview I did, it was quite a big role, and uh, I'm sure I was terrible. And then the, the second performance, I suddenly didn't feel nervous. And I think probably for one night only, I was actually quite good at something. Uh, and then by the third night, I was bored, and, and I found myself being aware of the three-dimensional sort of space more, and, and rather than my own character or story. And, and I realized that was very much a director trying to get out. Is there anything that you would say or give advice um, to people thinking about their projects of how, you know, so that it isn't just seen in isolation, that it actually does address, you've got to be aware of an audience. Yeah, it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day, that on, on the first night of a show, so the press night of a play for me, yeah. or the first viewing of something, uh, I realised that I, throughout my entire career, had always had an imagined person next to me watching it. Okay. And, um, <laughs> like a rabbit. Or a rabbit, rabbit. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But um, if you run a venue, it might be your core audience, it might be your new audience, it might be um, any number of people, your neighbour, whatever. Uh, you know, a memory of someone who's long out of your life, a teacher, a mentor. But um, what I realised is that in different points of my career, it's been a different person, a different right. imagined person. Okay. And I think you can make... Uh, that, that my work had been very inflected by who I thought ultimately I was making it for at some level. Had this existed, the Ignition Futures Fund existed when you left sort of college, would this be the type of thing that you would have gone for? Yeah, I think, I mean, actually I did have a... Uh, there wasn't really, like I said, there wasn't really the route map for, for this kind of funding. Uh, you know, it's, it's much cheaper and less risky for organisations to mentor people alone, yeah. to give people sort of placements and bursaries and study practices, research trips, but I did a bit of work with um, uh, Demos, the oh, yeah. uh, think tank. I thought it was a really interesting show and a piece of research they'd done about you know, s social living practices. And I did work it up into the beginning of a show, which we worked up to the National Studio, but it needed that bit of money to, to push on. I think it would have been great for I mean, whether we got through. But <laughs> what, what is the one thing, if there is one thing, that you would say to um, the people here this afternoon and to the people contemplating sort of uh, applying for this? What, what, what's the one word of advice that is going to sort of make their idea, you know, sing through and, and hopefully win for them? I think, uh, gosh, one. I mean, <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> um, I, I think having been, uh, well, as you know, on the judging side, I think the ability to be succinct and pitch in three sentences is kind of useful. Okay. I think the ability to, to portray something in a visual way, in, in the way you speak about it, to, to not say why or what or the argument behind it, but to say, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to come into the room and you will experience this. Uh, both Daisy and Phoebe kind of really made us feel that, and I think that it's easy to lose sight of that kind of basic hold my hand through the project. Um, 
I think um, make sure you're being honest to yourself. I think some people had maybe applied with interesting ideas that they thought might have pleased us mm -hmm. rather than were a continuation of their own practice and what they were exploring. Yeah, um, yeah and, and don't be afraid to take risks, really. I, I think, um, you know, I guess the prize is rewarding innovation and, um, you know, just, just push yourself on it.